the lesson that I want to bring is from Romans 8, verse 4 especially. And uh, I titled it, Walk Not After the Flesh, But After the Spirit. If you can turn your Bibles to Romans 8, and I want to read from verses 1 to 4. And I am reading from the New International Version, but the one that I would like to use later is just verse 4 of the same Romans 8 from the King James Version. But I'm going to read now first from the New International Version, because that's the one that most of us use. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Now verse 4 of the King James Version reads the following. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. When I read those words, and I thought a little bit about those words, I realized that sometime I wanted to bring a lesson about this. Because this, this word walk, meaning purposefully doing something to reach a particular goal, what is the end that we want to reach in that walking after? It means there are actually two things. The spirit on the one side and the flesh on the other side. The holiness of the spirit and the sins of the flesh. Two opposite poles. As we have a north pole and we have a south pole. And that's why I wanted to use this from the King James Version. Because it's so important that we realize what it is that we ought to be doing every single day of our lives that we should be purposing that which we do in having had a forethought about what it is that we are going to do. And the forethought is that we shall walk after the Spirit today, tonight, and again tomorrow and the day after. And that is the real purpose, or part of the purpose of being a Christian. I want to bring it into relation to what we in the medical world talk about, when we talk about walk, we use another word called gait. And I teach the third year medical students whenever I get them, because that's when they're really fresh. They're now some fifth years here, but then when they start doing the real clinical work in their third year, and I get them, I say, and they need to talk to this patient, and they are taught to say, good morning, wash their hands, how are you, sir? What, what is your name? And, you know, the meet and greet. I call it the meet and greet. And then I always want to just jump into whatever it is that they're supposed to do. And I say, no, no, no. Let's just take a step back. What was the first thing that you were supposed to have observed? And they struggle with that one. And I would say, it is when the patient enters that, that room at that door you should be already observing the gate, the walk. Why? You'd see, this is an acute person who's acutely ill. This is a person who's chronically ill. This one has a hip problem, or this one has a knee problem, or he has a back problem. It already solves a lot of issues for you. This is an old man, this walks like an old man. This is an old man like me, who walks like a young man. Um, so, you know, observe, gate, walk. So why would this verse 4 say, walk after the flesh, after the spirit and not after the flesh? And I used hypothetically a girl called Mary. So Mary is born, the little baby, and everybody's happy, and videos are taken, and it goes over Twitter and over um, 
YouTube also? I don't know. Uh, probably not. Fla yeah, Facebook, etc. All the photos of Mary. And then Mary reaches an important milestone. She's, one day she gets up and she's onto these two little feet and those legs and she stands by the chair and the cameras flash. <laughs> Mary's just started walking. And then it goes out on Facebook again and on WhatsApp, etc. Why is that such an important moment? What is so important about that milestone? I think the real importance of that for the mom and the dad and the stepfather and the mother and the grandfather and the siblings, etc., is that Mary will be able to live a normal life. Mary would possibly be independent from any disability in terms of her mobility. She'd be able to walk to where she needed to go. She'd be able to drive where she needed to go. And so it's an important milestone. Otherwise, she'd be able to live an, an independent life. But how does Mary get to walk? Do we, is it a natural instinct for us to walk? And it is not, because when you look at those kids called the feral kids, those kids who are raised with animals, or those kids who are raised in bondage, who are locked up in rooms, etc. Those kids walk on hands and feet. They're four-legged. Until they are rescued and they're brought into a situation where they are now to walk, uh, taught to walk on two, two feet and two legs. So what does Mary actually do? Mary starts imitating the parents. And she imitates all of those visitors who come to their house. Or if she'd been to the mall with her mother, she'd observed these people don't lie down or crawl or, 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 or sit. They actually get onto those two legs and they start walking. So now Mary is walking. Mary will grow up. And Mary would have to keep on walking until the day that she can walk no more. So what does she do with the rest of her life? Now let's assume that Mary does attend church because there's this big thing if you watch the news, people start talking about the churchgoers these days. I don't know if you started picking up the strange thing in South Africa. The churchgoers and the non-churchgoers. So Mary is a churchgoer and she hears the words, walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. What does that mean for Mary? What does it mean for you and I? And I looked at what else how else are, is this put in the bible and it's put like this walk after the spirit walk by the spirit walk in step with the spirit be led by the holy spirit live in accordance with the spirit live by the spirit those are just some of them and all of those have a little bit of a, a deviation but in, the, in it, when it comes to, it comes to one thing that we should walk in everything that we do in a particular manner. That as we had now, Mary had grown up, now Mary has this question, what does this mean for me? How do I walk after the Spirit? What are the tools of assessment that I will use to know that I'm really actually walking after the Spirit? Why should I even be walking after the Spirit? Especially when you're not a Christian person, you're not a real Christian, you have not been baptized, you haven't accepted Christ. How do you know why you should be walking after the Spirit? How do you know even what the Spirit is? So I don't want to dwell on our past sins in order to try and bring some relevance to the verses, this verse to our lives. Because we are reminded that we all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. To answer the question as to why should I, we actually already have read it in Romans 8 verse 1. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. And I was reading a book by Mark Batterson. He called the book, he called the book If. If you have an opportunity, go and read that book. It's a wonderful book. If. 
And that in itself, the title tells you something already. If only I had people like to say, if. He speaks of a term, he uses two terms, and he calls it double jeopardy. And he uses the two words condemnation and conviction. And he says condemnation is feeling guilty over confessed sin. And conviction is feeling guilty over unconfessed sin. And I pondered this and I tried to make sense of this. What does this now really mean? Condemnation mean, is, is feeling guilty. Remember the word feeling guilty? Those are important in there. About confessed sin. I've already now confessed the sin. Yet I stand condemned. By whom do I stand condemned now? And that's what we actually do. And I realized maybe a mistake that we make. And remember I brought a lesson on prayer, two lessons on prayer, and I'd like to bring some more on prayer. Is that we have given it to God. Because when we go to bed or whenever we pray, say, and forgive us our trespasses. And tomorrow we say again, and forgive us our trespasses. And forgive us our trespasses. And I was wondering... Isn't maybe a little mistake that we're making is that we don't qualify those trespasses so that we can put it behind us. You see, if I swore today, I shouldn't be asking again tomorrow, I think, if, we, if I had already asked tonight or today or after the swearing. Isn't that what it means that condemnation is feeling guilty over confessed sins? Meaning, having given it to the Lord... I didn't leave it with him. I took it back. And conviction is that which you will be convicted of had you not confessed. Now we know in our world uh, to be convicted is to be found guilty of an offense and to be condemned means to get a punishment for what you had done wrong. Now us as Christians we know we received a number of things on that day when we obeyed the gospel. We received the forgiveness of all our past sins. We received the Holy Spirit. We received the right to call God our Father. And we received the right to call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. And we received the opportunity of forgiveness of sins whenever we request that. In other words, when we confess those sins. So when you're convicted, you spend a little bit of time in prison, you're called a convict. It does not matter whether you had confessed to this crime or not. In this case, confession is not important. Somebody just needs to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you had done this thing, and you become a convict. You are convicted of an offense. You are therefore also condemned to spend five years, 12 years, 20 years in that particular prison. But with our Father, it's different. If we confess our sins, we are forgiven. And if we do not confess those sins, we are convicted by God. That's actually what Romans 8 verse 1 is saying. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. We're reminded that if we obey the gospel, there is therefore no condemnation. Just keep walking after the Spirit, which you had received, and you will be walking away from the flesh. Meaning the two poles. If you set yourself and your mind to the things of the Spirit, and to walk after the Spirit, and do, do that all the time, and to be aware of the fact that that is what you ought to be doing, and you recognize where the pitfalls are, then you will actually be walking away from the sins, and you will be walking away from the flesh. So an essential part of, 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 of walking after the Spirit is therefore being in the Spirit, being in the Spirit. How do I get to be in the Spirit? And we've raised that, that we receive the Holy Spirit. And how do I stay in the Spirit after receiving it? 
because we can receive it and we cannot utilize it. We don't even recognize it for what it really is. And that in itself, my testimony is, it comes at really at some stage it does dawn upon one fully. And unfortunately, I, I am of the view it happens a, a, a bit later in one's life. Where you come to the full realization of what it is to be in the Spirit or to have the Spirit. It takes time. And some people are never afforded that time. They never afforded that opportunity to get to that point in their lives because they're taken away too early to really experience that. So as a Christian, it's a wonderful thing to experience the knowledge of being in the Spirit. In Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17, we are said in verse 16 first, I say, walk by the Spirit. So there we are. We heard walk after the Spirit. We heard, heard be in the Spirit. And now I'm saying, reading, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh craves what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are opposed to one another, so that you do not do what you want. And when I read those nine words, I was again astonished, because we tend to read the Bible, and, but, but these are wonderful words. So that you do not do what you want. It reminded me again that that's our nature to be sinful. It's our nature to do what we want. And I want to almost put the word in brackets behind one, two. The word two in brackets. It's our nature to do what we want. How do I stop this innate thing in me? That thing which is me to want to do what I want. And that's not, so, that's not so difficult. Because we just read that. Walk by the Spirit. Walk after the Spirit. Be in the Spirit. Because the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. It means that no matter how much I desire to do a particular thing, for whatever purpose, sometimes... We want to say, but it is not so bad. It is, it is good because the purpose is good. This is the purpose. This is the thing that I'm going to do. And it's a wrong thing, but the purpose is good. So for whatever purpose, as much as you desire, also called gratification, no matter how much you, you desire to do that something, it should be such that we should be assisted not to do that. Not to fulfill the senses. Not to go after the taste of that Coca-Cola if you are a diabetic. Making an example. If we purposefully walk after the Spirit. If that was a decision that you had made, that I'm going to walk after the Spirit for the rest of my life. In Galatians 5 verses 24 and 25 verse 24 those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. So now we hear something else. Let's also walk in step with the Spirit. Now to walk in step with something is to have a, a knowledge. You can't walk in step with something that you have no knowledge of. You, go, you join the army, then I first teach you to march, so that you, all of you can walk in step. You've got to have the knowledge of what that in step is all about. Can't put 50 people together, right, walk in step. Tension, not going to work. Training. Foreknowledge. To walk in step with the Spirit. So just as Mary started walking in imitation of the steps of the parents, we should imitate the steps of Jesus himself after our baptismal and walk in step with the Spirit. We're living in a, in a, in a troubled world and it's very frightening even for us as believers. If we're honest, yes, we have the faith, but we're also frightened. 
Things are difficult. We desire that grace may obtain full and speedy victory in the knowledge that as we give ourselves up to be led by the Holy Spirit, we are not under the law as a covenant of works. That's what Romans is also about. We're not under the law as a covenant of works. But also, the positive part is in doing that, our hatred of sin and our desire for holiness show that we are participating in the salvation of the gospel. When the fruits of the Spirit plainly show, it means that we are led by the Spirit. Let us, let us really, dutifully, purposefully, put our minds to it. To walk after the Spirit, to be in the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. To really feel what having the Spirit is all about. To have those joys, the, the seven uh, fruits of the Spirit. To conclude, I just want to read uh, from Romans 8 verse 5, because we read from 8 to 1 to 4. And verse 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Set ourselves by our minds in earnest to mortify the deeds of the body, to walk in newness of life. Do not be desirous of vainglory or unduly wishing for the esteem and applause of men not provoking or envying one another, but seeking to bring forth more abundantly those good fruits which are through Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of God. Romans 8 verses 9 to 10 says, again the New King James Version, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Listen to that sentence. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The works of the flesh are many and manifest. And those sins will shut men out of heaven. And my last sentence, I think is the very important sentence to take home. Christ never owned those who yield themselves up to be the servants of sin. Thank you, church.